because even though I'm in my own room and there's no one's like really in front of me, I know you're all here, but it's okay because God's got it. Um, I want to just start by, um, I don't know, my background of fields, I guess, is I've been with fields since I was, I think, 13 or 14. Um, and I stopped for a little bit when I left, I left to go to uni. Um, and then I met Lawrence in that time and then um, I told him what a great church it was and we came we came back together um, as a young couple and we got married um, and I guess that's where my main the main part of my testimony started um, but before I start I just want to say be careful of what you ask for because I when I was younger I was always I've always been a Christian um, and I've I've always said that I've never really had like a good testimony um that's kind of you know like the wow testimonies you get where people are like oh that's an incredible one um I was like oh my I've had like a really um not not easy life but like not a a poignant moment in my life I was like God's really been there for me um until last year um but it first of all started when um me and Lawrence started wanted to try for a baby um we we're both healthy and we we didn't have any like known health issues or anything um but when we started to try it took a little while um it took a year and a half and we went to the doctors and um nothing was really happening but we went to one of the wonder events at church um and we were both praying about it and god said um he was just like wait um and just hand it over to him and that was really, really hard. Um, but every night after that, every night for dinner, we used to pray and we used to say, thank you, God, for the baby you have for us. Um, and the Bible verse that really helped us through it was Proverbs 3, 5. Um, and it's trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not onto your own understanding. Um, and then one month later, thank God, we fell pregnant. Um, and then it was just before Father's Day, so we could tell um like our fa like we could tell our dads um on father's day that 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 we yeah we were expecting which was really awesome and um, the first trimester was really really good and um, i felt amazing and i was like i was like oh, thank you god like i know that some women really struggle um but i didn't have any sickness and um, i was i was glowing and i just felt really good about myself um and then i had my first blood test um which you have you have them like routine one when you fall pregnant um and that's when things weren't quite right but we weren't really sure what it was um, and I had a, pl a high platelet count um it was so the average is like 300 and I think it was 600 and um, throughout my pregnancy it got higher and um, they thought I had a rare blood disease blood disease but they couldn't properly test it because I had to have like a bone marrow biopsy just to check um, and obviously that wasn't safe during pregnancy. So um, they decided to monitor me. And um, then during my second prim trimester, it's when I started to feel really unwell. And um, it was really hard to know if it was morning sickness or a sickness bug. So I kept going to the doctors um, and I was being, I was admitted to hospital twice because I was dehydrated um, and just, I just wasn't very well. Um, so, because of that, I decided I really wanted to work for my full maternity leave, like my full, um, I guess my full pregnancy, I wanted to work right to the end, but I decided to go on maternity leave six weeks before I was due. Thankfully I did, because I went on maternity on a Friday. And then I felt really off on Saturday and Charlie Charlie wasn't moving as much. Um, and he, he was moving in a different way, which we were quite concerned about. Um, me and Lawrence prayed that night and I tried to sleep. Then Lawrence went to church on a Sunday morning, um, but I stayed at home because I, I just didn't feel really like up for it or really well. Um, when he got home, he said that I should call the maternity um, ward in hospital just to ask to get advice. So I remember I, I rang the phone, um, I rang a number, went to, uh, like they answered, and I just went to talk and I burst into tears. And thankfully, even though me and Lawrence were both nervous on the phones, he, he stepped up and he explained what was going on. And they said to come to the hospital. 
Um, obviously, because it was six weeks before, we had nothing planned. We had no hospital bag. Um, we thought um, we thought we'd just pop in for like an hour or so to be monitored, then come back home. Um, so I was I went in. I was connected to the machines. They monitored the movement of the baby, like with a heartbeat. Um, and after 45 minutes, they weren't happy. They weren't really telling me what was going on, but they just didn't know what was wrong. Um, so I was taken up to the maternity unit. We were waiting to hear what was going going to happen next. And the nurses, the nurses then walked in and they started prepping me for um, an emergency C-section. And at that point, me and Lawrence were quite shocked and we cried quite a lot. Um, then I was speaking to Lawrence and he said that he he cried quite a bit. He won't mind me saying that, but um, I I think I went into that fight mode where I was like, actually, I need to be strong because I've got to make sure the baby's okay and Lawrence is all right. Um, so we kind of prayed, we sent out a prayer request. Um, Lawrence then phoned all of our families just to let him let them know. And then um, I was taken into the operation theater. Lawrence was gonna get ready, but they had to like, they had to do the operation really quickly. So he didn't have time. And at 34 weeks, four minutes later, Charlie was born. Um, and obviously a C-section wasn't planned, but thank God that we were both okay. Um, Lawrence then saw Charlie be wheeled to the neonatal ward just to make sure he was okay. And then I remember coming out of it, but then um, I had to be rushed up to the um, like the different maternity ward because I wasn't very well. They thought I had, might have shock and sepsis. Um, so I couldn't see Charlie that night. I had to wait till the next morning um, because, yeah, just because I wasn't very well. I stayed in hospital. But that was also another blessing um, because nothing, they didn't really know what was going on with my body. I still wasn't very well. Um, a few days later, I continued to decline. Um, and But I was in that time, I was really, really stubborn. Um, and I remember one night Lawrence told me off because I really wanted to, like, like most mums, I wanted to breastfeed. Um, so I went downstairs to the maternity unit unit to see Charlie in a neonatal bit and um I just I probably wasn't strong enough to actually walk down but I remember I wheeled myself down there I was like I'm gonna go down and see him did that three times that night and then the next day I had to stay in bed um but God was with us that whole time um and then New Year's Eve things things then took turn for the worst um it I just wasn't wasn't well so they took took some tests um and then a few days later after the test, they prepped me for, um, it was probably the mo one of the worst days that I've had. Um, Lawrence, bless him, he was oblivious, which is great. Another another good thing. He was at home putting the Christmas decorations down, getting the house ready for me and trying to come home while I was at hospital, um, getting prepped for um, a colonoscopy <laughs> and um, also a CT scan. As you can imagine, the colonoscopy wasn't great. Um, it was quite traumatic for me, but I got through it and um, they found it like they found what they needed to. So then I had a CT scan, but before the CT scan, I had to have a cannula put in. Um, and I was so unwell, it took them 20 attempts to insert the cannula um, to put the dye in to see what was going on. And that was that was really hard because I wasn't very well. And at that moment, so I put a cannula in, I was laying there ready for the CT scan. And the, the surgeon walked in and he basically said to me, um, he was like, we're gonna have to remove some of your intestine and you'll have a stoma bag. And then he just walked out and left me. Um, so I started to cry and the scan started and I was like, actually, no, like I need to, I need to be strong. Um, so I started to pray because that's the only thing I knew what to do. Um, I've always learned to lean, lean on God and, He's just always been there. So I was like, I'm by myself, but I'm not because God's there. Um, so I, um, yeah, so I just started to pray. And at that point, I knew that, um, that God was there and that I just started a family. And I just had a feeling that it wasn't the end for me, but that that God, God had more of a plan for me. Um, so, I suddenly felt peace and at that moment I knew that God had got it and that that then became my 
of my phrase for the whole time is that just God's got it because I just didn't know what else to say just that he'd got it um, and then another Bible verse that came to mind was Psalm 46 10 and he says be still and know that I am God um, and sometimes in moments that are so out of your control you know that God's there and that that he he never changes no matter what your circumstance is he'll never change in it his love for you will never change or his power his presence his peace like it's just so it's just there the whole time um and he was in full control of that moment I was quite scared but I had that peace um I came out of the CT scan and I met Lawrence he he obviously had no idea what was going on but I had message to say that um I was going for these tests um, but I was like, stay at home, it's fine, and then come come back and see me. Um, so I, I remember I left the room, the CT scan, and I think I was either in a bed or wheelchair, I can't remember, but Lawrence was by my side, and I just looked at him. I knew that I couldn't tell him what was going on until we got to the room, so I just said, as long as you know God's got it, that's like, just God's got it. Um, so we went to the room, and I told him what was going on, um, and we both cried again because it was quite a big surgery to have, and especially a week after having Charlie. Um, the weird thing that had happened, because not many people know what a stoma is, I, I quite like watching YouTube, um, I watch vlogs and things, and there's one girl, um, a year before I felt, no, just a year before the operation, um, we'd watch these videos about a girl with a stoma, we were really interested in it. Um, and fascinated by like the whole process and so we had a knowledge of it and I think that was God preparing us for what was going to happen it's just really funny how things happen um so we kind of knew what what it was so it wasn't as scary for us um but I was then prepped for um surgery that night and we texted the church um just to ask for prayer and we told our families and in the surgery, I ended up having 80% of my large intestine removed. Um, and I can have it reversed in the future, um, but we didn't know that at the time. So after the surgery, I was doing really well. I managed to get out of bed. I walked a little bit and everything seemed to be going well, so well that the surgeon said that I'll probably be going home in three to five days, which was really amazing because I was like, great, I can be back with Charlie. Um, I hadn't seen him since my operation. And then the next day I noticed that I had like a little spot on my tummy. I didn't think anything of it, but then each day it got a little bit bigger and it got quite sore. So I got, I told the nurse and she was like, oh, it, it looks a little bit infected. Then she took the dressing off my wound and that was all fully infected. And at that moment, that was probably a really like, that was another really hard moment because I'd gone through two, two major surgeries at that point and I trusted in God and I knew that I was going to survive it but then I think because I'd got up and walked and I was ready to go home and then suddenly I realized that I wasn't well and um, I honestly I remember turning to my my mum was there thankfully Lawrence was with Charlie my mum was there and I just said to her I was like we need to pray because I feel like I'm dying um, and that's when you need to really trust in God um, because everything's out of your control. Um, but I, I knew that it wasn't the end and I knew that I had to be strong and mum um, prayed for me. Thankfully, I was group brought, brought up in like a real um, faithful family um, and that Lawrence is such a, like, a strong man of God and like he, he prayed for me as well. Um, and so I went in for another operation and that was when they attached, um, I forgot what it's called now, but I had like a pump that was attached to my wound, um, a vac dressing. And that basically cleaned out the dressing like all the time. So I was attached to a machine and um, that I had, to, I had to walk around with it in a little bag. I don't, some people might have remembered it when I went to church um, and it made a really horrible beeping noise that would be in my mind like for the rest of my life. But we can laugh about it now, which is really good. Um, and so I had the operation, but that was all part of God's plan um, because, because the operation and the infection, they want to make sure that I didn't get infected again. Um, and I was put in a little room 
in the hospital by myself. Um, a lot of people probably wouldn't have liked that, but um, I could then see Charlie. So it had been 10 days without seeing Charlie. Um, and that was probably the best day of my life is when um, Lawrence brought Charlie in. And yeah, just, uh, it makes me emotional now. Um, just that I'd gone through all of that and I could still hold Charlie. And he, yeah. And he was just, it was just amazing that God had kept him and kept Lawrence so strong. And that Lawrence had been doing everything, like he's just been chucked in a deep end. Um, and he just picked it all up. And I don't think we could have done it without God, like without having our faith, without having church, um, everyone just encouraging us. Um, so after the second operation I had, the no, third operation, sorry, I then had to go back in under general anaesthetic to have my dressing changed because um, it just hurt too much to have it taken off. Um, so it was quite funny because I just, it just became the routine. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm not scared of going under anymore. It's quite like, it was nice to have like a little bit of a sleep that was forced because I couldn't sleep so well at, um, in the hospital. So I kind of went in, had my surgery, text Lawrence, I was like, I'm out now. Um, he'd then bring Charlie. So I was in hospital for seven weeks in the end, recovering and resting. Um, and in that time, Lawrence, he would, so Charlie was in hospital for two weeks in the neonatal. Thankfully, he was fully healthy. Um, and there were no, no real issues with him. Um, and he, Lawrence brought him home. He had his first night and for seven weeks, he'd gone from um, doing the night feeds. He'd come, he'd walk to hospital. We'd see Charlie. We'd, we'd just have, we'd just have lo a lo really lovely family time in the little room. Um, and all the nurses loved it because he was such a little baby. Um, then Lawrence would bring him home. I'd then rest and that would happen for seven weeks. Um, and I was feeling okay. And I had, um, I had a real respect for my body, which I'd never had before because that had always been something that I'd struggled with is that, um, cause I've, I've always been a, a little bit on the larger side. I like my food, I like my cake, but um, there's nothing wrong with that. And I've learned that the thing that matters is your heart and how you care for people and how you love people. Obviously I still have days where I struggle with it, but I know that that's not, I don't take my, my body to heaven with me. Like that just stays, that stays here. Like that's not who I am. Um, so I'd got out of hospital and we were like, oh, it's great. Like I felt really amazing. Um, and I had a really good bond with Charlie and Lawrence had, done amazing we'd kind of start to get back to normal life as normal as it could be and then one month later after we got out of hospital I then we went into lockdown and um, I was then classed as in extremely vulnerable so I had to shield um, and Lawrence was put on furlough and um, that was that was another blessing that we had because it meant that I could still rest and relax and still recover because I still had um part of my wound was still open. So in the end, Lawrence had to change all my dressings um, every other day because I wasn't allowed to go out of the house. Um, he was he was at home until I think it was June. Um, so we were in our own little family bubble and yeah, he'd changed my dressings. He'd helped me with my stoma. He'd then look after Charlie with me. And he just, there was never any um, moment where he complained um, and we just joke about it now because sometimes like if I don't do something I was like I almost died you know and he was like yeah yeah like you can't say that anymore because you're here so it's okay um but yeah it's just amazing that God plans everything for you he plans a perfect person for you and things like that um so we got to summer everything was okay I was eating well and then something changed and then um, I thought it was another sickness bug but it was a similar symptoms as before um, and I was like, I've got a stoma now, like, I can't, it can't be the same thing again, because that was taken out. Um, and at the end of October, I was ill again. I went to the hospital, the doctors, because I felt really dehydrated. He, it was funny, he looked at me and he was like, you need to go to hospital. So he phoned up. He's like, right, go in. Um, I was in for a week 
it was the start of the first the second lockdown I was in for a week then I was sent home and um, they just found out that I had um a, a I don't know if it's called a disease, but it's some, it's called Chogue-Strauss syndrome. Basically, my blood vessels inflame, um, and that attacks. When they do inflame, it decides what organ to attack, and then it does. Um, and at that point, they they thought that they started me on steroids and everything, and it was okay. Um, so they sent me home. I was home for a day, and then I started to get pain in my stomach again. I thought it was just trapped wind to start with, so I tried to power through. Um, and about two o'clock that night, um, I woke Lawrence up because I was, I just had like a really bad pain in my stomach and I couldn't, I, I just sounded really weird. I, I don't know if any one of you have seen, um, probably only a few people have, a lady falls out, it's a YouTube clip, a lady falls out of, um, she's stamping on some apples and she falls over and she basically traps her, traps herself and um, like her wind and she, I guess she sounds a bit like a duck or something, like making a really weird noise. So I sounding like that. And um, Lawrence's dad came and took me to a hospital quickly. Um, and it turns out that I had acute pancreatitis um, and at the top of my small intestine had started to get attacked. Um, so I was then in hospital for another three weeks. Um, by that time I'd lost from pregnancy to now, I'd lost about five stones. So I wasn't, I was quite small um, and I just looking back at the pictures now we we just don't it, I just look really ill and like but I'm just thankful now that I look so well even though I've put weight on because of steroids I just just thankful that I'm here and I am well um so I've now been put on medication um and I'm doing really really good um praise God and just um that is I'm just thankful that even though It'd be nice to have a miracle that I'm completely healed um, now. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It might not, that might not be my story, but I think that um, I needed to go through everything that I went through to um, appreciate my body and appreciate me and appreciate who I am because I had real low self-worth. Um, and I think if I had a miraculous healing, I don't think I would have appreciated who I was. Um, so sometimes... Sometimes it's really hard when you are unwell and you're like, God, you've healed someone just like that um, and I'm being left behind, but that's not true. It's, that isn't your story. Your story is something different um, and your story is only for you and God has planned that for you. Um, so, uh, yeah, like I said, after all of this, I wouldn't have had the support from Lawrence. Um, he, he looked after Charlie. Um, and pastor asked me to ask Lawrence um, what he thought about the whole situation um, because obviously I can tell my story um, but people forget about everyone else around it um, and Lawrence said it was horrible seeing him so ill during the pregnancy I just felt so helpless frustrated by the situation but then when we went to hospital it got a lot scarier in a very short space of time between Charlie suddenly arriving and M getting even more unwell. I didn't have too much chance to process it, at least for more than a few moments, with the exception of the night that M had surgery, AKA the longest night of my life. But seeing M so calm and at peace with everything gave me the reassurance that we'd be looked after and not just by the doctors and nurses. I honestly don't know how I managed with Charlie on my own. Well, I do know now, but at the time, I knew that I just had to crack on for him for the sake of him and Emily. Um, and that was when I remember regularly em talking with Em in hospital about how people man manage to deal with things without God. But fortunately, that was never the option for us. And we thank him for that. Um, so um, I, we realised that this, this month um, marks the month that I haven't been in hospital for six months. Um, I'm now on new medication, I'm feeling a lot better. Some days I wish I was fully healed um, and I wish I didn't have to take medication, but I'm thankful that it's there and I'm thankful that that keeps my body at bay and it keeps it, um, stops it from having flare ups and things. Um, and yeah, like I said before, it, I have, I had issues about my body, um, about my body confidence and I always thought, it was silly things like I thought I wasn't 
couldn't go in band because I was too fat. Um, like people would look and think, oh no, she can't, which is really silly because that's just in your mind. Like no one thinks like that. And if they do, like they've got their own issues and we need to pray for them and we need to help them because they're hurting inside. Um, and um, my body's a vessel for my soul. It's not who I am. Um, and like I said before, I don't, I don't need it when I go to heaven. Um, so I shouldn't let it hold, hold my, I shouldn't let it hold me back now. Um, and I'm free from lots of my negative thoughts, um, which links in with the, the talk. Um, so John eight thirty six. So if the sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Um, and yes, the thoughts do try to come back, um, and they try and they try in the moments when. Oh, Sorry, I think I just turned it off a little bit. Yeah. Um, there are moments when um, you're at a low point and you think actually like all those thoughts come back, but you have to stop yourself and be like, no, I know, I know what God says about me. Um, and one thing that one psalm that I always read is Psalm 139, um, but especially 13 to 14. And it says, for you created in my utmost being, you've knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that, and I know that full well. Um, I'm still on a journey. Ironically, yesterday, last night, um, Lawrence knew, knows this, but I had a bit of a breakdown. I was like, I can't do it. Um, I'm not good enough to to do a talk. Um, and I'm not saying that for sympathy. I'm saying that for people who don't think they're good enough to step out because um, if God's given you something to say, then he's given you that for a reason and that he'll give you the strength and the power to do it. Um, and it's really fun. The enemy just was on one last night and I was like, obviously I need to share because he just kept throwing things at me of like, you weren't, you were in hospital so you couldn't do certain things that normal mums can do, but I'm here and me and Charlie have got such an, a good bond, sometimes too much because now he won't let me like he won't let me do things on my own which I sh I'm really grateful for but sometimes you need a little bit of a rest um but yeah just just the personality God's given Charlie is amazing um and he makes us laugh every day um and I'm so I'm still on a journey I'm I've been told I can have a reversal um and it's another major operation so we have to think weigh it up when I'm gonna have it um and at the moment, I'm like, we're going through another journey of when we can try for our next baby. Um, I've got to be signed off by the doctors to make sure that I'm fully well. Um, and not going to lie, it's hard because we probably would have had a second child by now. But I know that there's a reason we haven't had a second child and that if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, then that's part of God's plan. And he'll, he'll settle our hearts and he'll give us that sign for it. Um, so yeah, just, um, I, yeah, during this time, like I've always said that God's got it. Um, and if you don't have, if you don't have the words to say to someone who's struggling or if you're struggling and, and you literally don't know what to say, but you have a faith in God, just say that God's got it because no one can take that away from you. Um, no one can take away your faith. No one can take away your God. Um, yeah he's his ours and he will he will strengthen you and he'll he makes you who you are um and he's made you who you are and you've got your own story and yeah I think I think that's yeah he just makes you stronger in who you are um yeah I think that's I think that's every that's part of my story up to now um I'm excited about what God's got for us I'm nervous as well because of what we've already been through. Um, but I know that he'll help us through anything. Yeah. So thank you for for listening to my testimony. And I it either passed you back, I think I passed you back to Rich Pastor yeah. Richard. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You, you know, Emily, you are the most beautiful person. You are so inspirational, and we've seen this journey. Here. Esther and I, when we could, we'd go and visit Esther, uh, Emily in hospital, 
and she was just amazing that's all we got god's got this she was so, so full of faith and so full of expectancy that god was going to work in her situation and you are a work in progress and you know what em doesn't matter about our bodies we're going to get new spiritual bodies so <laughs> look forward to that uh so that was really inspirational emily and you know having a baby must be really traumatic in lots of ways and so many people have traumatic births but for what you've gone through to all of that having a, a slightly premature baby in charlie and all the stuff you've gone through to stay so positive you are an inspiration to everybody that hears you and, you know, if anyone's struggling with their slow, with low self-worth or their image or anything else, you know, we'd love to pray for you at the end of the service, if that's possible. So we're going to move on. I'm going to ask uh, now Sabian to share his testimony. So stay with us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sabian. Hi there, guys. Uh, like uh, Richard said, I'm Sabian, if you don't already know me. And... Uh, I've been at Fields about three years, uh, so not quite as long as M, um, but I'm, I'm learning to be part of this family. Uh, I tend to do a lot of things behind the scenes, sort of sound and uh, alpha, push and explore. So if you see me there, then hi again. But this is a bit new to me, so please be patient with me. Uh, today, I also want to talk about self-worth. Uh, it's been spoken about a lot over the last few weeks. Some people have got just the most powerful testimonies. Emily again today with just such an amazing testimony. Um, and God has so much to say on it. Um, so I'm going to sort of fly through my story, but there's going to be some notes to that will pop up. Thank you, Amelia, um, to help you uh, keep up with me. Um, but first of all, what is self-worth? Self-worth is the internal sense of being good enough and worthy of the love and belonging from others. So many of you have known me for the three years that I've been at uh, Fields, and you've probably known me as quite a self-assured and quite a bubbly personality, I hope, most of the time. But it, it wasn't always that way. Um, from the ages of 17 and 18, I... I had quite a turbulent, turbulent year. Um, I lost some loved ones. I had some real big breakdowns in friendships and relationships. Uh, I started to see uh, psoriasis, a condition that I have, start to worsen. Um, I even was bullied by some peers who I actually knew had a faith, um, and I just didn't really expect it from them. So um, I basically left my sick form year with next to no self-worth but my only saving grace at the time was a relationship that I was in with someone that I I felt I could trust um, even though I saw no value in me I believed that if someone could see value in me then um, it was yeah my time was at least worth it uh, unfortunately that relationship broke down when um, the person chose to be unfaithful when it was the the second time in two different relationships in six months that someone had been unfaithful with me. So it left me in a situation where I had literally zero self-worth. Um, and I looked at my situation, I looked at my circumstances and I came to a conclusion that it was better for me to not be around. Um, now, I realised that that's obviously the wrong decision, but at the time, uh, my I felt like my self worth was at a cost to other people, which, of course, it it never is. Um, and if you ever find yourself thinking that, you know, I'm telling you now, it is never at a cost to other people. Um, you are amazing, who you are, and um, God wants to to say that to you today. Um, this could be a common narrative among people where the situations that you find yourself in, that well, the situations that I found myself in, none of them individually could break my spirit. None of those broke my self worth. But the fact that the snowball effect of all of them over the course of a year built up, I just was surrounded by negativity and I just didn't see a way out. Um, 
and the conclusion to not be around was the only thing that I had in my head to end the hurt and the negativity. The thing, um, but it's an incredibly permanent decision to what is ultimately a, a temporary problem. Although it's, it's so common, uh, the stats tell us that one in five people have these negative thoughts um, all over the world. So it, it, that, that stat really scared me when I found out about it because I felt so alone at the time and I felt like no one else had ever th thought about it this way. But um, knowing that there are others, a lot of others who have had these thoughts really, really scared me. Um, and I don't want to belittle anyone um, and say that your problems aren't big because they will feel huge and they will feel like they really take over your lives. Um, but I can tell you right now that the love of God is bigger. And the Bible shows us that this wasn't an issue just now, but this was an issue 2000 plus years ago. Uh, and there are a few individuals that, that openly stated their desire to not continue with their lives. Um, and I just want to focus on one who felt that way. Elijah is one of my favorite people in the Bible. The confidence he shows and the trust that he has in God to be with him is just incredible. And, and God rewards him by um, just these incredible miracles throughout his life and by showing his enemies the power that he has. But he got caught out by worrying about a lady named Jezebel and, and rightly so Jezebel was not a nice person a few of you will probably know the story um, up until this point Jezebel had killed multiple um, hundreds of prophets like Elijah and had threatened Elijah with the same uh, the same circumstance the same treatment this meant Elijah had to run uh, so in 1 Kings 19, verse 3 to 4, he tells us that Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Bathsheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life and I am no better. I, I am no better than my ancestors. Now, Elijah here is clearly distressed. He's, he's tired, he's worn out, he's alone, he's fearful. He starts to believe that his worth has run out. And he starts to believe that the mistakes that of those before him matter in his life. However, Elijah does do one thing really, really right here. And he takes all of that distress and lack of self-worth and he places it before God. And he prays. He meets with God and he's honest. And he doesn't take the matters into his own hands. Do you know what God's response is? Rest, food, and water. And then it's rest, food, and water. In 1 Kings 19, 5 to 7, literally following on, it says he laid under a bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. God really starts with the basics when we go to him. And this is so important if we're struggling, especially with areas of mental health. To make sure that we rest, take on food and water. It, it, it seems so basic, but from experience, I know that it was something that I totally disregarded because I had no disregard for myself. I had no regard for myself. I never used to drink. Um, I used to go days without food and my sleeping pattern was atrocious. And that's because I didn't care enough about my well-being to do so. The other thing that's worth noting here is that Elijah's situation didn't change. It didn't change overnight. 
Elijah is still in danger, but he goes on to travel for 40 days. What has changed is he's brought God back into the picture of his life and the picture of his suffering, suffering and the way he felt. Now, there were still some times where he probably felt really low. And uh, there's probably some times where he, he really struggled with the situation that he was in. But now he had a renewed purpose. Elijah continues to converse with God, continues to trust him, is setting out his paths. And God continues to trust Elijah with his plans. He even places a servant in Elisha who goes and follows him. I consider Elisha more like a friend because God knows that Elijah needs someone to be with him, a support network. He even goes on to see Ahab later on in 1 Kings, who is married to Jezebel, the woman he is so fearful of, to tell him that the way he acquired a vineyard was wrong and that the same fate will befall him that before the person that he took the vineyard from. There will be times in our lives where God calls us up to face the factors that make us lose our self-worth. But only when we are ready, because he knows by tackling them, we start to grow in stature once more. It becomes proof that God has built us for a purpose far greater than what we can see in our times of distress. When we bring these burdens to God and trust him to bring us back to basics, we start to realise that our value is not in the situation, it's not in our job, it's not in our cars, it's not in our house, it's not in our relationships, it's not even um, in what people say about us. No, our value is found in Jesus and it's found in him. And did you know that even Jesus felt distressed that he called out to God? In Matthew 26, 38 to 39, he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus knows the strain that you're going through. and Jesus knows the extent to which a situation can have a bearing on the way that you feel. He knows how it feels to call out to God and say, I don't think I can do this. But he follows it up with, I'm going to trust you anyway. Jesus goes on to complete a promise to die for you and me, to free you and me, not by his own doing, but by the hands of man. But he did that with love to see you live and to see your life with God and his plan for you, which is bigger than anything you are going through. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. He wants to see you full of self-worth because you are beautifully and wonderfully made. Thanks to M for using that verse. I feel like it's a really big pointer for today. Um, I also realised that I left you on a little bit of a cliffhanger with my personal story. Now, the reason that Elijah's story touches me so much is because my prayer and my time of need was not dissimilar to his. My prayer was literally as follows, Lord, I do not want my life, but I am willing to hand it to you. Do with it as you wish. And I really, really meant it. God handed me a lifeline and I'm so blessed for that. And I'm so glad that I took it. I gave my life to Jesus and I haven't looked back since. In short, from that moment, I have learned to feel like I do belong. And when I don't, I've asked God to show me, to show me where I belong. It's not always been easy and I've had to forgive myself and I've had to forgive those around me in the past. And also face the fact that sometimes I was at fault and I made a wrong decision, which led to me having those negative thoughts. I still mess up and I still believe situations are bigger than God sometimes. Um, and I still don't have the self-worth that God blesses me with every single day. But I know with God, anything is possible. Constant conversation with God and others who know him, just like Elijah and Em and her family, brilliant, love that, are the building blocks of self-worth. 
he will show you grace, love and care to get you back to his plan for your life. I love that we say uh, good grace today because I really feel like that um, just encapsulates this message. Um, I realise that I've personally spoken about extremes today, but if you ever find yourself questioning your self-worth and feeling uh, you don't belong, please, please take that to God. And if you're willing, please take that to someone else, someone that you could trust. Elijah had Elisha. Uh, Jesus had Peter, John and James in his time of distress. I'd also recommend getting yourself a mentor or joining a connect group just to bounce ideas off and stay accountable to. Elijah trusted God and was rewarded by being taken into heaven uh, by a whirlwind, which I think is really, really cool. But before that, he had to go back to basics. Some of you may be starting this journey and some of you may have felt that you've slipped over the last year or so, especially without a physical church to go to. So I really want to talk about the first steps that I took once I gave my life to Jesus. I didn't know that I was doing this at the time, but I really focused on one area of my faith, which was serving. Building up a desire to work for the Lord and be a part of a church in that way really helped me cement myself and kept me connected with God. I was a drummer, so I became part of the band, and then later on I became part of the sound teams. And what I found with that is that alongside being disciplined and learning songs, turning up on time, is I was actually surrounded by great people who would pray a lot and read a lot. Then I'd hear people mention scriptures in prayer and point them out in songs, and I'd go away and I would read those scriptures and what went around them. So by serving, I learned to pray and read my Bible. And it can be as organic as that, as long as you're willing. I did jump straight into praying every day or reading every day, which don't get me wrong, is the best medicine for an unsteady heart. But build up to it. This is the start of you finding your place in God's plan and moving your self-worth from circumstance I see your value in Jesus or to see your value in Jesus. It won't necessarily happen overnight, but if it hasn't already, the journey can start today. Thank you very much for sticking with me. Back to you, Richard. Well, that was quick. Thank you. Thank you, Sabian. Um, yeah, I just uh, just making some sort of notes as you were chatting there. You know, one of one of our biggest problems as people, especially men, we don't share how we feel. We don't share what we're going through. And part of the, 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 the uh, solution to becoming free is identifying that you, you are in need, that you have a problem, and then talking to someone about it and sharing how you, you know, what you're going through. And too many people keep quiet and things you know, seem like they're under the radar. And, you know, these testimonies are, are just so powerful. It's such a powerful testimony, Sabian. There's more to it than that that you shared with me in the past. And hopefully you'll have an opportunity to share a bit more about that as, you know, you unpack uh, something else as you teach more. Um, but um, I just encourage everybody. We, we, we're coming out of a season of 15, 16 months in lockdown. Uh, well-being, mental health is going to be one of the biggest challenges that we as a nation face and we as a church face where people struggle with low self-worth is a massive problem. There have been many people that have shared with me uh, how they feel about that. And, you know, they think nothing of themselves and struggle with their identity because our identity is in Jesus. And, and I want to say to you, friend, if you're going through what any of these guys have gone through and going through and, and, and the subsequent stories that we're going to hear over the coming weeks of people's testimonies, the, the things that they struggled with, you know, they're, they're being set free. It is a process. Sometimes it can be instantaneous and sometimes it is a, it is a progress and sometimes a process and sometimes it's a long process. But the, the thing I, I hear from um, Emily's testimony and Sabian's and many others is that people don't give up that they get God in on the picture. They find help. They get someone to help them. You know, find expert advice. Go to your doctor if you're struggling with stuff. 
come to your church leaders if you you need prayer and you you're struggling with any emotions that, that seem to be overtaking your life um, and find help and we can help you we're here to help people jesus didn't come to start a religion he didn't say look i'm here now i've arrived now guys i'm preaching in the synagogue next sunday come and hear me he went out into the streets and the highways and the byways like Luke 4.18 said that he came to preach the gospel to the poor, to set captives free. There are many people that are held captive by invisible chains that we can't see. And I believe with all of my heart that Jesus wants to set you free. And what Jesus did after he finished sharing that verse from Isaiah in what we can see in Luke 4.18, he went about doing good, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, you know, making blind eyes see. Jesus wants to help us to overcome all this stuff, the anxiety, the fears, the worries, the, all the stuff that seems to be coming against us. And like I say, Esther and I are here to help you, to help you overcome and find that freedom that we all need. So I'm gonna just pray. I just wanna pray for everybody this morning. So if you just, just bow your heads for a moment and, and maybe these people's stories are really challenging you to find help. I just want to just pray a blanket prayer over everybody this morning and just pray for, for that freedom to come to every person. Father God, we come in the name of Jesus. And we bring every person under the sound of my voice into remembrance right now. I know there are many people that suffer with anxiety, fear and worry and uh, anger and bitterness and roots of unforgiveness, shame and guilt. Lord. And you came to take all those things. You came to set us free. And Father, I pray for anyone going through those things. Firstly, that they'll identify that they have a problem. Secondly, that they'll go to someone and share exactly how they're feeling. Never be ashamed to share how you feel. And as part of these testimonies, I'm going to share some of my testimony of what I've gone through in the last few months over the coming weeks when I'm able to. And there's no shame in that either. I believe God wants to set you free. So Father, for any of those people suffering, especially with low self-worth, anxiety, fear and worry, that they bring it to the cross. They call out to you, Lord, and they find help. And we just pray for them right now that they would find healing and freedom in Jesus. And in all these things, we give thanks, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, what I'd like to do is just give those people an opportunity. And after that, I'm going to pray for people that maybe need Jesus or want a relationship with Jesus. And then after that, Esther's just going to step in uh, to the off my office here and just pray for the dads. So just stick with us for now. Um, I believe, friend, if you're here for the first time and you just tuned in to this church service, maybe you're watching us online uh, on YouTube and you're here. I believe you're not here by accident. And I believe that God has been knocking on the door of your heart. And maybe some of the things that you've heard in these testimonies have given you hope when things go wrong in our lives. That's not sometimes the end. There's hope beyond that. And in these testimonies, these people that have shared, have offered hope to you listening, I believe today that there's hope for your situation. There's hope for you in Jesus, if you just give him a chance. And I believe God's been knocking on the door of your heart. And you know, at the door of our heart as a handle, it's on the inside. And would you open the door of your heart to let Jesus in to set you free and heal you too? If that's you, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. Just Pray this prayer after me if that's you. You want to commit your life to Jesus. Maybe you've been a church goer and you've come to the place where you think, I don't want to be here anymore. But you're here today and you've heard this testimony from Sabian. You've heard his testimony and you feel I want to give God a chance and God's speaking to you. I believe he's speaking to you right now, friend. Open up your heart, your heart and ask him into your life. Just pray this prayer after me if I'm speaking to you. Say, Father God. I come to you now in the name of Jesus. Father, forgive me for anything I've done wrong. Forgive me for my sin. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and save me now. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me to take all of my sin. I also believe, Jesus, that you were buried, but you rose on the third day. I ask you to come into my life and save me now. 
In Jesus' name, amen. If you've prayed that prayer and you'd like to contact the church and get in touch with us and you'd like to speak to somebody, contact us at hello at the Fields Church and someone will get back to you. I'm going to close the service and then ask Esther to come. Well, I'll ask her to close after me if that's all right. So God bless you. Thanks for tuning in. Here's Esther. Hello there, sitting in the hot seat. I just want to um, say happy Father's Day. And I hope all our dads have um, found something through their post today. So I'd just like to honour you fathers today. And I also want to remember the fathers that are not with us, that have gone before us. I'm very thankful for my dad. I'm very thankful for the values that he, that he planted. And, but I also appreciate there's fathers that maybe didn't always do as maybe fathers should. But I'm so thankful for our Heavenly Father. And I want to encourage our dads here to keep seeking God, to keep allowing God to help you be the best father that you can be, the best grandfather, the best man you can be. So can we just close our eyes? And if you have a dad next to you, put your, put your hand on him and let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for dads. Lord, they have such a key role. They become a dad when they have children. And I thank you, Lord. For, I just think that we've got new dads. We've got Adam, who's a, his first time to, be, to celebrate Father's Day. We thank you. Thank you for new dads. Thank you for dads that have, are dads of children that are much older. We thank you for dads, for all that they do, for the influence that they have. Lord, for the role that they play, it's so important and so imperative to allow the children to say, follow me while I follow Jesus, as I follow Jesus. So we thank you, Lord, for our dads. And we commit this, them to, the, to you this day. Thank you, Lord, that whatever they're doing, they're spending it with their family or friends or whatever they're doing, Lord, we honour them today. As, as a church family, we honour all our dads today. And we say thank you for them and bless them in their days and months ahead, Lord. Lead them and guide them in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, can I close in prayer? Dear Lord, we thank you for this amazing day. Thank you for these two precious people, Emily and Sabian, who've opened up their hearts, who have been so brutally honest and open with sharing with us to help us realise that we're not alone, that so often the enemy says that you're the only person that's going through this. But Lord, there are so many people in our precious family that are going through, have gone through. And I just thank you, Lord, for the inspiration that they are, for their honesty. And we speak a blessing over them right now, over Sabian and Emily and Lawrence and little Charlie. We speak, Lord, that they will continue to, find, to, to have victory in their lives, that they continue to um, be transformed and you, you will bring them through, Lord. And they, they are victorious. And thank you, Lord, for the inspiration that they are. And we commit our, our all to you. We commit ourselves to you. And thank you for this week. We look forward, Lord, to our service, our weekend next weekend, to be able to come together. So we commit everything to you. Thank you for this day. And that you've been in the very centre of all that we do. In Jesus' name. Amen. I think we're going into this, there's um, virtual cafes to pop into, get your coffee and we'll meet up. And I think um, we're, I think Adam will open up the, the, uh, the various uh, breakout rooms. So thank you. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Love to you all.